Hello, my name's Daniel Monk and I'm a professor of law in the School of Law at Birkbeck. And I'm delighted to be joined by Lynn Siegel, who's a Meritive Professor in the School of Psychosocial Studies at Birkbeck, and really the expert on everything to do with the relationship between love and politics and intimacy and care. And she's the perfect person to talk about the new divorce law that's just being introduced in April. And the new law is going to sweep away the Divorce Reform Act from 1969, which means all references to marital conduct and adultery become something in the past in relation to the law. So farewell to adultery. Um, in the book that's being published today, which I co-edited with Joe Miles and Rebecca Probate, we try to sort of explore every aspect of divorce and really put it into its complexity and explore all its full complexity. And I've got a couple of questions for Lynn. And my, my first question, Lynn, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation, is um, the 1969 Divorce Reform Act was passed at the same time as pretty much the same time as decriminalization of homosexuality and partial decriminalization of abortion. And it's seen as very much part of that era. But at the same time, there's a real ambivalence around feminist engagement with divorce. And I'm really curious to know what you think, what you think the debates amongst feminists at, in 1969, in that period, tell us about the late 60s and generations then, but also about feminism more generally. Right. Um, wonderful to be here, Daniel, discussing your new book on divorce. Um, first of all, I want to say something about your title, Farewell Adultery, because uh, the very concept, of course, has an archaic ring. Um, <laughs> you're also a humorous ring, which you're always good at. And uh, I do think it probably should have been um, the title of the whole anthology, but... Um, I can see why it sounds a lot more serious to have the divorce bill since 1969. And, but also your title races me back as well to what I was doing in the 1960s, which is just on the cusp of women's liberation, which I'm soon to gallop into, to all those romantic comedies of my childhood in the 40s and 50s, like David Lean's uh, Brief Encounter, which is apparently still one of the most popular films of all times, which of course, like all of Noel Coward's romantic comedies, is about adultery, but adultery doesn't happen. So, I mean, so many popular films I remember, you know, like Marilyn Monroe's The Seven Year, In the Seven Year Itch, where the skirt flies up, but adultery doesn't happen. You know, it's just too dangerous for most um, women in the 1960s. Um, so what did we think about the 1969 um, Divorce Act? Well, I think the first thing is, say, on the cusp of feminism. We're not quite feminist yet. For instance, in 1969, I entered a shotgun marriage. That is, I was blackmailed into marriage because I was pregnant. And it was very much still the case that um, illegitimacy was a terrible stigma. And so though I was um, the daughter of quite enlightened Jewish parents, both doctors who didn't really care about uh, morality very much, but did care that their first and indeed only grandchild uh, might be illegitimate. That stigma was too much. I mean, they really said to me, you'll kill us off. And no, uh, so I got married. Yeah, the stigma around illegitimacy, it really is such a crucial issue there. It absolutely haunts the law. There's a haunting of all there around illegitimacy, which is one of the ironies is when lesbian gay activists got upset that they weren't allowed to have adultery in their law too, of course. Who wasn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, now you can <laughs> rejoice that it is the same uh, <laughs> conditions for everybody finally. So anyway, I had my shotgun marriage, but many marriages had occurred for that reason, accidental or, or desired pregnancy. And also many of those post-war marriages were very, very unhappy. My parents' marriage was not very happy. And so what we do uh, as we become launch women's liberation is that actually we were in flight 
from marriage. So we weren't so much welcoming the divorce legislation as uh, uh, advising women not to get married. Remember, don't do it, die, which, uh, which we very sensibly advised uh, Diana not to do, Princess Diana, which, uh, of course, in retrospect, was very, a great pity for her in many ways that she didn't listen to us. And this does tie in with abortion rights. We didn't want women to be forced into marriage, and we wanted women absolutely to have control, you know, over all reproductive issues, over our sexual relationships. And so um, <clears throat> divorce was an issue, although a sort of side issue in a way, although I do very much resonate with um, the article you happened to send me from the book, um, Sharon Thompson's uh, uh, chapter on Edith Summerskill and how she opposed that 69 divorce law as a feminist, you know, calling it um, a Casanova charter, you know, and she was so right to say then, as we'll probably come back to later, is so true still today, that most women financially lose out over divorce. And most women's work in the home is not recognized as some of still wanted it to be recognized. In some ways, um, it takes me back to debates over wages for housework, which yeah. most feminists oppose. You know, women aren't just housewives. And, and what we want is more welfare resources to support uh, care work of every sort. We want men to be sharing housework and we didn't think that wages for housework would help that and yet yeah. you know wages for housework still thrives today and I think there there are many rings uh, to uh, taking me back to Casanova's charter and the idea of how do we both protect women from becoming financially impoverished recognize women's caring labor at the same time as build women's autonomy. And there is a tension there always for feminists. Mm. And that tension is really clear there in the debate around the 1969 Divorce Reform Act. You can get these feminists on both sides then. But it's also an interesting window into a generational moment, because you also sort of imagine 1969 being lots of 68ers. And of course, they're not the people involved in the Divorce Reform Act so much. They're young going off and doing things. It's, it's other people. And it's a, it's a certainly slightly older generation where it really matters, that sense of really being stuck. And that you're, it's important, I think, to rem constantly be reminded of this myth of the meal ticket for life and that the d divorced women are the poorest women in society. Single women, statistically, who haven't got married, are richer than most divorced women. And I think that figure is quite important to remind people about. I mean, I want to move forward a bit to the new law and to think about, well, looking to the future with adultery, this thing in the past, what personal politics arise with debates about the end of relationships? Because I think that's a bigger conversation when you try and imagine, well, what is a good divorce law, which is something we try and think about it in the book a bit. Um, what we come across often is this huge silence about the end of relationships generally. There's a lot of campaigners talking about relationship recognition of getting into marriages and importance of recognizing cohabitation is part of acknowledging the importance of the end of relationship. But what's your thoughts about the politics of the end of relationships? I think one problem for me <laughs> as a socialist feminist is that um, I always have to play place relationships, marriage, divorce, and so on within the wider context of what's happening in society generally. And what's been happening in society generally is what many people have summed up as the feminization of poverty. Well, of course, there isn't simply a feminization of poverty. That's not the case. I mean, many men are very poor and some women now have joined the super rich and have considerable power. But nevertheless, what happens in marriage? What happens in marriage usually, and the whole purpose of marriage is to have children, you know, the woman is still expected to be the main one raising the children as well as she's still doing that. That means, as my friend Barbara Ehrenreich said in the 1980s, many women are only one step away from poverty 
and that is divorce. You know, they're only a divorce away from poverty. And so as we've seen inequality deepen, we've seen those dangers for women if they become single women, but in particular, obviously, if they become single mothers, increasing. And they've increased because of the rolling back of welfare. You know, I think that, um, you know, when divorce happens today, as yesterday, men and women are probably equally distressed, depending on who's been the main uh, cause of the divorce occurring. They're both equally distressed, perhaps men even more so, unless they've been wanting it, because um, threat, of course, if they have children, that they're no longer going to be living with the children, because one thing that 69 Divorce Act ended up doing, partly because of some skills, I understand it, and her delaying it for two years was saying women can live in the matrimonial home to look after the children. So, you know, it was a problem for men. And yet what we know is that it's a bigger problem in the end for women financially, financially. I mean, you know, we all want the autonomy today to, that's to do what we want to, but there's a financial problem for women. I think it's that you've mentioned the word autonomy a couple of times, and that always strikes me as one of the, the paradoxes and the, the, the problems that we encounter there is this sense of autonomy being aim and also wanting to trouble autonomy, of course, in all the politics that you've written about about care is precisely saying autonomy is this myth. And yet somehow it's a very powerful myth that the law keeps on producing and reproducing, yes, yes. even as, alongside its embracing being very progressive. So getting rid of adultery is almost sort of saying, well, you know, marriage is just about rights and, you know, you can get out of it if you don't want. It's all about autonomy. And yet that leaves those fundamental questions of care out of the picture. And that's what relationships in sense are about is care. So when they end is what do you do when a care relationship ends? And I think that's quite fraught ground sometimes. It's very fraught ground. And I don't suppose all relationships are equally caring. As I've said, it's still the case that, men, that women seem to be doing more of the caring than men, although men are doing a lot more caring. And I'm sure there are just some cases where they're sharing the caring equally. But it's harder. I mean, because another thing that's happened is the working days got longer and longer. We know that most women are out at work and um, working similar hours to men. And so what that's meant is actually an offloading of care, like it or not, onto substitute maternal workers. And those substitute maternal workers, as we know, are incredibly paid, badly paid, often migrant and immigrant labor linked to the whole care chain. And uh, so that's another thing that gets disrupted on divorce. It's not just the wife <laughs> yeah. who has to be uh, looked after, but and the children, but you know, the whole care the whole basis of care now for me I think it's hard for any divorce act to know to get things exactly right because to get it right would be trying to improve our whole welfare system which has been rolled back and to make child care more social rather than just a personal responsibility well what's quite exciting I always find quite exciting about divorce law is that on divorce, property rights go out of the window and the judges can redistribute wealth. And of course that can't happen with cohabitation and ending of those relationships and redistribution of wealth as we know is very difficult generally. But divorce law almost provides that in that privatized space of marriage, suddenly law has become very creative around redistributing wealth. And I always hoped that we could use that as a model for redistributing it more widely. Um, um, and I'm really delighted you mentioned films when you started talking, because one of the chapters in the books by James Brown does indeed explore all the films. And there's chapters there about novels as well, because I think they are the stuff of melodrama and stories. Of course. And I think those stories will carry on. Um, who knows what the law will look like, what the storytelling will look like without having adultery as the sort of the scaffolding backing backing these things up um thank you so much for joining me to talk about um divorce I and mean, thank you for illuminating and broadening the perspective it's been a real pleasure thanks a lot thank you thank you daniel i've got a lot to think about too <laughs> thank you thanks bye bye